Well, uh, good day, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to this um, NI webinar on professional development. My name's Martin Fothergill. I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager um, at the Nautical Institute. Um, I'm joined by David Petraco, Director of Projects at the Nautical Institute. Um, he's uh, in London, UK, and Gillian Carson-Jackson, Senior Vice President and Fellow of the Nautical Institute um, from Canberra in Australia. So uh, before we get, get going, just a word about the format of the webinar. Um, it's gonna last about 45 minutes, and that will include a 15 minute Q&A session at the end. Um, in a moment, I'm gonna hand over to David, who'll say a few words, and then um, to Gillian for the main presentation. Um, but as we go through, uh, please feel free to submit a question. Uh, you can do this through the control panel um, which you can open and close by clicking on the white arrow against the orange background um, top right of your screen. Um, also, we've added a PDF handout to this webinar, which tells you exactly where you can access all the resources that you're going to hear about. Um, and finally, please do contact us at the email address shown on your screen if your question doesn't get answered um, or you'd like any further information. So thank you very much for joining us and I'm now going to hand you over to uh, my colleague David Petraco. Thank you Martin and uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, I don't know about you but we're certainly in lockdown which uh, uh, gives a disparity of our backgrounds. Um, but before I hand over to Gillian I'd just like to put into perspective of why the Nautical Institute are doing this series of webinars. First and foremost, the Nautical Institute is a professional body. We're the leading international professional body for uh, maritime professionals. Professional bodies um, are for everybody, uh, doctors, lawyers, nurses, they all have their professional bodies. And the purpose of a professional body is to help people with lifelong learning, or in other words, continuous professional development, depending on what you want to call it. But it's all about this. And the world's going through some really big changes at the moment. And it's so essential to maintain your professional standing, to maintain your professional knowledge. That's what the Nautical Institute is for. And we aim to serve our members primarily. But there's also a lot of resources that we've opened up for non-members as well. Um, so just as a bit of a background, uh, the Nautical Institute was founded um, somewhere around 1970, uh, 50 years ago, um, and it was because the world was changing. Um, new ship types, containerization, new techniques and tankers, modern electronics like radar, um, and a bunch of professional mariners got together and said, we need to keep ourselves up to speed, we need to keep ourselves um, maintained, we need to keep ourselves employable. So let's form a body that will help us keep ourselves at the top of our game. And that's what we're still doing. So membership of the Nautical Institute is open to all maritime professionals because all maritime professionals have a need for lifelong learning. It doesn't matter if you're what rank you are or even if you're still at sea. Um, you still have the need to be uh, maintained uh, in a professional status. Now, Julian is a perfect example of this because he's had an illustrious career. And it's a career that has spanned not only subject area, but also continents. And she would not have been able to do that if she hadn't applied continual development along the way. Um, she's also a perfect example of how a career can be focused on the human element and helping others learn. So she'll, she'll touch on some of those subjects. So I've known Julian, Julian for a while. Um, uh, I don't have her CV in front of me, but I seem to remember her started with the Canadian Coast Guard, uh, VTS, vessel tracking, then she came over to Ayala uh, uh, headquarters in Paris, and that's where I met her. Uh, we've worked together ever since. Um, she's worked in AMSA, she's done other jobs in Australia in uh, aids to navigation, navigation training. She's done a lot of work with us in VTS and VTS operator training. So huge, fabulous background. So it's uh, 
such a pleasure uh, to hand over to Julian Carlson Jackson now, fellow of the Nautical Institute, fellow of the Royal Institute of Navigation, and a bunch of other stuff. Welcome, Julian. Fantastic. I am about to try and show my screen. I'm just going to choose which screen to show, I hope. I am switching screens as we speak. And you'll tell me when you get it. Oh, why is it not showing up? No one can see my screen, it says. Why can no one see my screen? Which screen are you seeing then? Okay, so I one quick check here. I will just get the correct screen up, I hope. It says show screen. I am showing. I hope it's going to work now. It's got a screen. It says it's on air. Is that correct? Uh, no, Julian, I, I don't see it. Oh, there it is. You just have to launch it in presentation mode now. Yes, I have to try and get to presentation mode now to launch it. Uh, there it is. Perfect. Excellent. There we are. Bingo. I hope you can see my screen now. So it's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate uh, in this and to present on this session, this lockdown, an opportunity to grow professionally. And we put a question mark on it. And I think one of the things is, I don't know about you, uh, but things are changing so fast that sometimes I feel I'm, I've lost my way. I'm a bit, uh, it's almost like it's slowed down so much I've lost steerage way. And I, I want to think about what is it I can control? And perhaps there's an opportunity within this, this difficult time that we have to actually grow and to move professionally. But one thing I want to start with is this concept of the sphere of influence. Now, you might have heard of this one, and it, it's pretty straightforward because really, basically, at the center where that little red dot is, that's where we can control. That's us. That's who we have control over. And it's got a limit of that. Then we have that area outside where we have a bit of influence. So if you think about who you can influence in your life, it might be that you have a bit of influence at work. Uh, you have some influence with your family. Uh, it, it has that limited though. You have some areas that you can influence, but then there's those things that are out of control. And that's, I think, the situation that we're finding ourselves in right now. Uh, so when you can influence, you've got your work, your friends, maybe some of your family. But right now with COVID, 19 is an awful lot that I think is feeling out of control. And there is an opportunity perhaps to take back a bit of that control. And that's one of the things I want to, to talk about and to see from a human factors point of view. In a sense, we're all a bit rudderless when we're in this COVID-19 environment. It's something that has not, this is uncharted waters. So what is it that we can do? How is it going to play out? We don't know. But where can we have that influence? Where's that sphere, that influence of control that we can have? Gillian, can I just interrupt? Um, I yeah. think the slides the slides are showing a, a, a sort of larger aspect than they should be. I wonder if you could go back to um, oh, okay. how you had it previously. Sorry, it's just that people can only see a, a proportion of the slide. Oh, I'm not let me sure just go if you're able back. to re reset it or sort of reduce it in size. I'm going back. Okay. I'm working on it. You still All can't right. see it. Uh, so. I can I can see the whole slide now myself. I'm just waiting for feedback from others. Okay. Um, I think I've just taken it off. Have I? Uh, we can we can see the presenter mode. Oh yes. Apparently yes. We can we uh, they can see the slide now properly. No. Is that better now? No, it's no. we can only see, we see it in the presenter mode. So um, uh, with the notes. Okay. Well, that's no good then. So let me just take this off and see what I can do about why this is not working. Okay, so I've taken that off the screen completely. I think they could, they could see the whole slide, but it was with the notes as well. Yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> yeah, we we have practiced. It did work fine yesterday. I'll try this again. 
Oh no, no. I think it's when you when you click on to maximize it, that's where it goes wrong. So I think if we have it just, I think I think if we have it like that, that would be that would be okay because you you can see the whole slide that way. How about yeah, like that? Is that yeah, that's, that's that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. Is that okay? okay I'm not quite sure what's going on because it worked fine yeah. the other time. Um, yeah, that's fine. Very good. Okay, I'm just going to continue on because I don't want to take too much more time. So this is our influence of control. Um, actually, it's kind of nice because I can actually just use this as well. Let me just get rid of that. I'll make everything a bit bigger. We can make that all a bit bigger. Oh, we'll make this go here. So this is our influence of control that we can have. Um, one nice thing I wanted to talk about was within this influence of control, we actually have ourselves at the center and we can have some some strength or some power that we can have around that. So we can actually have this opportunity to choose who we want to be during COVID-19. And when we're thinking about, is this an opportunity during lockdown to, to grow, or is this an opportunity during lockdown to sit in fear? Uh, I got this actually from Gareth Locke, and you'll be able to find the credit there. And you can go to Paradigm, um, hp.com and see some more about this whole idea about sphere of influence. I don't want to spend too much time on that because I do want to bring it really into who we are uh, when we're looking into the future for our own selves. So who do we want to be during COVID-19? Well, do we want to be in the fear zone? Uh, I'm not sure about you, but we had this whole time when we started going into lockdown and everyone went to buy something. In Australia, it was toilet paper. In other places, I think it was medicines. In other places, there were something specific that they felt they must have. So that, and that's perfectly normal. We went through that. Um, we have this, this anger, this fear that's related to what's happened because we have this concept of a new normal. They use that word a lot here in Australia, the new normal. So that's in the fear zone. Then we go into this learning zone. And that is, I think that a lot of the society is going into this learning zone. We're starting to realize there are things that are outside of our control. Remember our spheres. So there's things like this, what's happening right now is outside of our control. We realize that we'll still be able to go to the shops and buy toilet paper, but we may not be able to go out and have a picnic, for example. So we're starting to be aware of the situation that we're at. And we can acknowledge that people are working really hard to do their very best. Um, so we're sort of in that learning zone, but then ideally we can move into the growth zone. When we get into that growth zone, it's, well, what can I do? How can I start now pulling back that control? So if we went back again to this, to the slide, previous slide, where we had this whole area that's out of control, how can we bring our own sense of control and increase that so that we are able to get into this growth zone and take back a little bit of what's happened. COVID-19 has been a very interesting experience for the entire globe. It's different to SARS, it's different from MERS. It has been something that has grown so quickly that I think many of us could not have imagined how fast it happened. And so we completely lost that control. But we have this opportunity, and I do believe that perhaps there's opportunity within lockdown that we can move forward and we can start taking back that control and feeling into this growth zone so that we're away from that uh, out of control and the fear zone. We really want to move out of that. That's where we can have this concept of professional growth. So we've moved out of the growth and we know more about what's happening to, around the world, but we are in the maritime environment. We have this ability to increase and to grow our skill sets. So we can think of growth and ability and knowledge, advanced learning, personal investment, taking the time to, to take control and to invest in our own futures, mentoring by sharing with others, competence, going through training, using experiences and experiential learning. So this is, I think, an opportunity not, not to stay stagnant. So it's an opportunity to grow 
and to grow into a direction that we have time to take control and see where the future is going to come. So we don't need to be rudderless. We don't need to be uh, completely in uncharted waters. And as mariners, we're pretty adaptable. We're used to social isolation. Um, being on a, on a ship in the ice, icebreakers, we'd have crew change. And always for the first week after crew change, everyone would get sick because someone would bring in new germs, but then we'd all get very healthy and be almost impossible to get sick. You're in your little bubble. So uh, we're used to isolation, we're used to uh, adapting and changing. And this is just one more thing to adapt and change to. But there are challenges as well as opportunities. For those of us ashore, we're working from home. And working from home has its challenges. I, first time I worked from home, I had no office. I was on the dining room table. Um, I had young children. Um, now they've all grown and gone. It's very difficult. You're not set up to work from home. It can be really difficult. The ergonomics of your workplace will have changed completely. The, the background environment. So while you're trying to work, there could be a, a dog running through or there could be a child trying to play or someone else is taking your attention away. So it's, it's got its own challenges. But the benefits as well from working from home is, you know, you can call out and say, okay, coming, I'm coming home. And you step out of your office and you say, okay, I'm home now. So you can come and go with your work. But there's those physical challenges and there's also the psychological challenges. You need to set time frames. So I will work in a certain time frame. You need to have a routine so that you can in, enjoy as well having home life as well as work life. You don't have that physical change, so you somehow have to make a change. Uh, working from home also has its challenges because of bandwidth. And I remember one of the comments I saw for this webinar as well, everyone's trying to be online right now. Everyone is using the technologies we have. So there's some real concerns with bandwidth and access. In Australia, I have to say that we don't always have the best bandwidth. As a backup, I've actually got my 4G network on my phone ready to jump onto my computer in case I lose my Wi-Fi. So that is a new challenge and it comes into that technology. One of the challenges and opportunities right now is this lockdown, especially for those who live alone. So it's it's a challenge enough when you have someone else in your house that you can talk to. But if you're on your own in Australia anyways, you cannot be connected with anybody else. If you want to go out, you can have two people, just two people are allowed to uh, be together with 1.5 meters of distance. So it's very, very lonely. Um, in this environment, but perhaps by taking and using technology, you could have that connection. So there's the social interactions and the limits. But all of this, I think, provides opportunities for professional growth. Now, for those of you who aren't at home, and so many uh, seafarers are on board vessels, they're still unable to do crew change. I've just finished the assurance committee with the Nautical Institute, and we were talking about the fact there are there are thousands of seafarers who have worked long beyond their terms. And that fatigue element is coming in. On the other side, there's thousands of seafarers who are expecting to go and start a, a contract, and now they're not able to start that contract. So there's all of these challenges that are around here. We are starting now to, to lose control again. So how can we bring back that control? Well, I think we can bring back control and that lockdown gives us an opportunity to work more cohesively towards our own future. Professional development, continuing professional development of your own self and also of those that you work with. So you can keep up to date with everything that's happening with the coronavirus, with the Nautical Institute, and they have a special site there. Um, we have been very lucky with, as members of the Nautical Institute as well, that our CEO is sending us a weekly update newsletter. And he's had a wonderful opportunity to help promote and coordinate with other members of the maritime industry. 
Uh, one specific thing that he was working with was in Marsad and KVH. Back to that technology, we want to be able to have that connection and to provide some access. Then there's the seaways. All of the editions of 2018, they are all now available free for you to review, and they're on that website. This is a huge body of knowledge, an entire year's worth of articles and seaways that you can then use to take control. On the website, there's the jobs, not in career opportunities. There are professional short courses, and there's the Navigator app now. I actually went to download this Navigator app, and if you just type in the Navigator, you're going to get all sorts of things. So if you type in the Navigator app and you also type in Nautical Institute, you get the picture that's on the slide. So you'll be able to actually find the Navigator. You have this opportunity for free webinars, and this is just one. There'll be more coming. And then if you look at healert.org, you'll see all sorts of information about the human element. And of course, the Nautical Institute has a very good resource section um, with their reports. Now, that's if you're anybody. If you're an NI member, there's some additional benefits that you have. And this is very, very exciting for NI members. As you know, we have that free online video tell course every 12 months and that comes with your membership and that's fantastic but what they've done now is they've actually worked with video tell to get an extra 25 percent off additional courses during this time of COVID-19 so between now and the end of July you can register for an additional video tell course with 25 percent off this is new thing, these bite-sized learning. I like this, bite-sized learning through the MicroLearn platform. And that's on the My NI section. I put a little picture of what MicroLearn looks like. And one thing I'm specifically proud of is the continuing professional development work that we've got going. This was an initiative of the Nautical Institute a number of years ago. And it provides you with a great opportunity to keep track of everything, all those micro learns, all of these webinars that you attend, the articles that you work, the conferences that you are able to participate in, this can all be put into your continuing professional development and create a body of knowledge that then helps to promote you. It builds your body, your knowledge base, and it also gives you your opportunity to interact with others. And for the Nautical Institute, there is an opportunity to participate in members-only webinars. And I think at the end, Martin might give you a little bit of a taster of uh, a webinar that's going to happen on the 28th of April. Um, and that's under the members-only area. So that's just a little bit of a summary of some of my thoughts, you know, going back to this question that we have here. Uh, is it an opportunity to grow professionally? Learning about what's happening with COVID-19 and where we're looking for in the future. I think we can take control. We can keep that control in that center of our sphere of influence and realize that there are things out of our control. They will happen, but we have an opportunity to grow professionally through this environment. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. That was excellent. I, I really like to think about it in terms of control. I think that's something that uh, most mariners will understand very well, um, uh, how, why you need to take your environment uh, under control in, in order to, to do a good job. So, uh, Martin, um, I, I know that people have been texting in some questions. Um, you want to fire one yep. at us? Uh, abs absolutely. Um, let's start off with, um, should I have a plan for learning? Quite a simple question. Should I have a plan for learning? I would say most definitely. You need to, um, you don't want to be stuck to your plan though. It's, it's, it's a bit like a guideline in a way, but just like you would be charting your course, uh, you'd be doing your, your uh, birth to birth passive plan, you should have a, a plan for your learning. 
but you also have to realize that that plan will have to change depending on weather or other conditions that might happen. But if you don't have a plan, it's really hard to get started. So if you have a plan, at least it gives you that first step along the line. Um, your course might change partway through. My course changed multiple times through. I never thought I'd end up in Australia. But if you don't have a plan for learning, then it's really hard to get started. Uh, Julian, I, I came up on a good example of this the other day. One of our members um, had wanted to be a harbor master. Um, and so while they were still at sea, uh, they did one of our harbor master courses and got a harbor master certificate. They then went for a job interview. And when uh, in the job interview, uh, they were asked, uh, why are you applying for this job? They were able to explain that for years they've wanted to be a harbor master. They've explained that they had been to seminars, that they had done the course, that they had got the certificate, and all the things that they had done within their own professional development to help them be a harbor master. And they got the job. And it was it was purely that. They had a plan, they stuck to the plan, they were able to demonstrate the plan. And as opposed to somebody saying, oh, well, I just wanted to come ashore and I thought it might be a good idea to become a harbor master. So the, the plan can be very effective when you're dealing with employers. Okay, th thank you. Thank you very much, Gillian and David. Uh, another question here, as a shore-based professional mariner, can we keep abreast of, how can we keep abreast of current practices at sea through the NI? Oh, I say that the fact that they're participating in this webinar is just one of the uh, one of the best ways to do it. And the fact is, if you're at the NI, you have a great opportunity. Things at sea are changing very quickly. And and obviously, you know, it's been a while since I was a cadet and I was on the ships in Canada. But being able to keep abreast of the activities, the Seaways magazines are very good. The webinars are very good. And the interaction with your branch. So the branches have a very strong technical background. Many of them are seafarers as well within the branch. So you've got land-based and, and seagoing members within your branches. So engage with your branch, engage with the, uh, your colleagues in the Nautical Institute and participate. The Nautical Institute is an institute for members. It is, it's built around the members and the members have the expertise there. So the Nautical Institute is a really great opportunity to continue that link with the sea when you're in a shore-based position. And it, it, it's interesting because before I took a, a post at the Nautical Institute, I myself was a member, I still am. Um, but when I was thinking about joining the Nautical Institute, I was looking at some of their uh, terms and conditions. And one of the things that really struck me was the mission of the Nautical Institute is to support those in control of seagoing craft. Now, I really like that. That, that, that. that made a lot of sense to me because it would have been the easiest thing in the world to say, to support the captain, to support mariners. It doesn't. It support those in control of seagoing craft. And this recognizes, as does our membership, that mm -hmm. it's not just the captain that controls the ship. It's not just the officers of the watch. It is the ship managers, the ship owners, the ship financers, the insurance company, the regulators, the VTS. You know, all of those people have to be professional. All those people have to have continuous professional development for everything to work smoothly. So, yes, it's important that if you're working ashore, you participate in all the ways that Jillian mentioned to keep abreast of what's happening at sea. But it's also very important for the people at sea to be able to rub shoulders with all the shore management and explain to them the reality of how their regulations, their design, their uh, inspection regimes are affecting ship operations. So it's everybody's got a role in promoting safe and effective shipping. Thank you, David. Um, I've got a question here from Antoine. Um, are there any short online courses you could attend in this period in order to develop? And I think I can uh, provide a preliminary answer to that. Um, obviously, there are the video tell courses. Um, now, you don't have to be a member to take a video tell course, but if you are a member of the NI, then you get one free course per 12 months. Uh, so that's an example. Also, if you're a member of the NI, you can engage with the microlearn courses. 
Um, David, did you want to add anything to that in terms of short online courses? Yes, okay, there, there's a lot of ways of developing and Julian touched on this and some of the things that, that, that she said, um, and they don't have to be specific to maritime. There's a lot of leadership skills, management skills, and they're all over the internet. Some of them are free, some of them aren't. A lot of people doing free webinars. Uh, there's a lot of YouTube channels. Um, there's, it's just phenomenal what you can learn. But as Julian said, come up with a little bit of a plan. Do you want to improve your, your uh, people management skills? Go on and, and try to find that. There are a lot of resources out there. Um, there's a lot of very good distance learning courses. Uh, there's even distance learning degrees you can do. Uh, I, I did my master's degree by distance learning. Um, and that was before the internet. So I remember being in phone booths at three in the morning in Singapore trying to call back to get tutorial support. Um, but it is possible. Um, and, I'll, I'll, sorry, Gillian, go ahead. Can I say one thing on that? There's also, from the point of view of the courses, it depends on what you're looking for, but pretty much everything is now available online, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be asynchronous. And asynchronous means that it's a completely an online course uh, that you just run. It's almost like no, there's no instructor. It's a bit more like a webinar like this or what they call synchronous. So you can have an opportunity to, to learn from an expert or from professionals during this time using short courses, but don't think that they're going to be, you know, a bunch of slide, a slide deck that you're going to work your way through. They can be very, very interactive with a lot of good expertise. And some of the best experts are out there now providing um, counseling and mentoring capabilities, mentoring tools. Because of COVID, they're actually trying to get out there more and give you more opportunities. So this is a really great time. On the other side, though, is that, is that issue with technology, having access to the bandwidth and, and actually having the tools available? I might just, add, sorry, Martin, before you kick in with the next question, just further to what Julian said, there are a lot of opportunities out there and not all of them are cheap and not all of them should be cheap. Um, and that's where you have to assess whether they're going to be of value to you. But um, particularly with the asynchronous courses or the synchronous courses where you have a maritime professional delivering them, um, they have to earn a living uh, as, as everybody needs to earn a living. So um, find out what the course costs and find out what the value is going to be for you. Um, but the, there are a fantastic amount of opportunities out there. <clears throat> Absolutely. And on, on that note, uh, some useful comments from Gareth and Ahmad. Um, Gareth says, I'm currently on LinkedIn Premium and there are some really good uh, short courses on there. Um, and um, Ahmed was mentioning about other training providers like Marlins and um, uh, companies like that. So there are a lot of courses available. I've got a uh, question here. Um, which is, what are the most popular degrees for mariners? David, do you want to kick off with that? Uh, Julian, you, you, take, you take this one, I'll follow. Oh, well, what are the most popular degrees for mariners? That's, um, you know, Master of Maritime Management, I guess would be one of the first ones that come to mind. My very first, uh, uh, it was a diploma actually, it was a diploma of nautical sciences. I think it's actually a degree now. That was what I got as a cadet, my first work that I was doing. But it depends on what your goal is. It really depends on where your plan is, what you want to do. I wanted, I love teaching and I wanted to be in education. So then I went and got a Bachelor of Education and a Master of Education. But there are so many different types of degrees depending on what you're looking for. And it comes back down to your plan. And on the other hand, I know we talk about degrees. But often a lot of competence doesn't come through getting a degree. It could come through experiential learning. It could come through a, another type of certificate program that you have, uh, auditing, other types of training that you have. So while you might think, oh, I, want a, I want a PhD or a master's, you know, I was a simple sailor. I went to sea at 17 and I got my first degree after my first child was about five years old. So it's not something that you need to necessarily have to progress. It depends on where your career is going, but have that plan and then choose the training to fit with that. David. 
Yeah, uh, so there are uh, a number of maritime specific degrees, and you'll find these at some of the big uh, universities, uh, and they could be in commercial ship management, uh, ship design, accident investigation. Uh, there's all sorts of opportunities there. Um, there's the World Maritime University that teaches uh, very specific uh, degrees in uh, uh, maritime policy and, and, and regulation. Um, there's also an organization called the um, International Shipbrokers. Uh, the International Ship. What is it, Joey? The International Shipbrokers Associates. Anyways, ICS. Look it up. It's shipbrokers. Um, and Chamber of Shipping. Yeah. No. No. The other ICS. Oh, the other ICS. Yeah. Uh, the ship, ship International Shipbrokers. Something. But they do a lot of commercial courses for for shipping and they're module, and you can take them over time, they're distance learning, they do have some classroom, um, and they're a very good way of piecemeal working your way through to get a commercial shipping um, a certification and, and uh, um, degree. Good There's also I additional degrees as well through, um, Ayala has now put together uh, for age to navigation managers, so you can get a Master's of Age to Navigation Manager through the Ayala Worldwide Academy. So it depends really where do you want to go and where does the, what's the training going to do for you into the future? Okay, I, I have been corrected. It's the International Chartered Shipbrokers, ICS. Well uh, done. Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers. Or Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers, yeah. even better. Indeed. Thank you for uh, correcting okay. David. No, he okay. can have some time to say. Um, another question here. What courses are there for someone to get into trading or chartering? Ah, well, there you go. Yep, I, I would say the uh, the, the, the um, Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers is a, is a very good start. Okay, good start. Um, is it a good time for COC revalidation to be extended, say, six months to keep seafarers qualified? And available during COVID-19. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll deal with this one, Julian. There there okay. there are some very specific uh, recommendations by the IMO. Um, it's listed on our um, uh, COVID site uh, on, on on our website, um, and uh, most uh, flag states around the world, I believe, are offering an extension uh, to COCs. But um, check with the IMO recommendations. Uh, that are linked for, to our website and then check uh, directly with your flag administration. And, and okay. I can let you know that Australia has put something on their, AMSA has put something on their website and the IMO Secretary General has, has recommended that people take a pragmatic approach to this. So it, it's a very valid question. It's really quite difficult to get to do the training and most of the training institutes are closed. It's very difficult to do simulation training right now. So it would be almost impossible to get those um, the training required for that. Um, here, here's an interesting one. How does technology stroke automation affect maritime careers? Ah. Good one. Do you want to start one with David? Yeah, go, I'll, I'll go. Um, we, we've actually done a lot of uh, uh, work on this um, and uh, there's a, um, uh, a, a good article published in Seaways um, in March, uh, specifically on this, and it's called uh, Living with uh, Technology or Living with Automation, something like that. In general, um, there is a lot of automated systems being put on manned vessels at the moment. Uh, there's a lot of very um, prominent news stories about fully autonomous uh, ships. Um, we at the Institute don't see this happening in, in a hurry uh, because there are about 60, 70,000 solar ships out there that are built to be run by people. Um, and although they may have some automated systems on board, uh, they're not looking to get rid of the people anytime soon. And if you're really interested, there is a report that came out of the World Maritime University last year. Uh, it was pre-virus, but they did predict a steady growth of world trade up till 2040, and that despite the levels of automation, um, there would still be an increase in maritime employment. 
Now, the important thing for the Nautical Institute here is that we look at how that automation is used. Uh, there's all sorts of ways that automation can be used. It can be used to remove tasks, and that's not a bad thing necessarily. Um, using electronic charts removes the task of having to run around and take a fix and go into to the back of the chart room. You can now see in real time where your where your ship is. That's very useful. It allows you to spend more time looking out the window. That's very useful. So there are some very useful automated tools. And the trick for us is understanding how to define a beneficial automated tool and not a distracting automated tool. And the Nautical Institute and all the members are putting a lot of effort into working with the world community um, uh, to get that right. Julian? I'd like to, yes, uh, all of that, exactly. And one of the things that I have, so I am the senior vice president, which means I will become president through a very strange sort of handover now because we won't be able to have our our face-to-face -face AGM or, or conference. But one of my major questions that I want to ask into the future, and one of the things we've been talking about with the Nautical Institute is, what is a maritime professional in an increasingly autonomous and digital environment? So maritime professionals, that's what we are. We are maritime professionals. But, but what does that mean as we are getting into uh, additional technology, the use of technology? Where is a seafarer going to be working? I mean, it's one of the discussions we've just been having with the IMO committee with the Nautical Institute. With the maritime autonomous surface ships, what is the definition of a seafarer going forward? What is the skill set that we're going to need in order to ensure that we're able to continually continue to have the safe shipping? Shipping has to continue, but how are we going to have the skill set to move forward? And that comes back again to a continual professional development. Things are changing so quickly. How can we ensure that we have the skill set to move forward and that we can? drive the technology to meet the need rather than the technology telling us what are what we need so, so it's it's a bit of a, a chicken and egg sometimes the technology can develop very quickly but is that technology as, as david said is that technology actually going to help us to have safer ships cleaner seas um, more efficient transits so it it comes down to making the best use of technology but also starting to now take a look at our skill sets. Where is our skill set going to need to be into the future? And very interesting, Julian. Um, back in 1970, as I mentioned before, when our founding fathers wrote our constitution, they wrote that we should support those in control of seagoing craft. And 50 years later, that brings on a whole new meaning. It sure does. Martin. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. Um, a useful uh, suggestion from Andre Lagubin in terms of degrees, he mentions work-based learning with Middlesex University is great for mariners as they will recognize your STCW qualifications. So thank you for that, Andre. Um, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, what courses impress employers the most? David. Well, it's a it's an interesting question. Um, it depends on who the employers are and what um, uh, what uh, the job is going to be. But I would say, particularly in senior management, um, all the uh, uh, required STCW co courses are, are are given. So that those aren't it. I would say anything to do with personnel management, soft skills. Um, both in yourself and how to improve the teams that you work with um, would not only be um, a, a value to an employer, but a value to an employer in any walk of life, uh, on board ship or ashore. But so whatever you can do to help develop your understanding and management of soft skills would be a, a winner in my book. Okay. And Brilliant. I think I'd, I'd support that, David, as well. The I guess the buzzword back in the 90s was emotional intelligence. We've sort of gone beyond that. But it is that it is that concept of being able to work and to build a team together to lead that team and to have those soft skills. And one of those those things, we, we, we seem to be focusing a lot on, on formal training. And in my slide, I also put that aspect of 
developmental, experiential learning, mentoring. There's so many other ways that you can have skill sets. And sometimes your future employer are also interested by the fact of who you're able to work with. And there's uh, Andre's book there, Mentoring at Sea. So there's a lot of opportunities to have not just the degrees on papers, but also often when you go for interviews now, they're looking and they're asking you to give an example when something happened. How did you deal with something that happened? And that's where that experience comes in. And having had that opportunity to, to work and to lead with teams or to work with a mentor to help you prepare, that can, that can also help. The, the degree or the thing on paper might get you through the door to get to the interview. But when you get to that interview, you need to have those experiences behind you that you're able to then bring forward into that interview process. Lovely. OK, well, thank you very much, um, Gillian and, and also David, um, a really useful webinar. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, and thank you for your questions. Um, we hope you found it useful. Um, there is a handout. If you've had problems um, downloading it, then please do get in touch with us uh, at the email address shown on your screen. Or if you've got any uh, questions that weren't answered or um, if you need any further information of any kind, please please do get in touch. Um, and uh, lastly, um, a, a thank you to Ericsson and Magda in the background who you haven't seen, but who have helped to make this uh, webinar possible. So thank you guys um, for, for your help. So well, on that well, note, Martin, yep. will a recording of this be made available? A recording of this will be made available. Uh, we will email everyone who registered uh, for this webinar, and we will let you know um, where that recording is, so that you can uh, so that you can view it again. So I hope that I hope you'll find that useful. Okay. Well, thank you very much, um, Gillian and David, and thank you all for tuning in. Uh, and uh, please do look out for um, other. NI webinars coming up in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.